Mike, people can have your attention for just a moment. I think we have a word. I'm not sure everyone can hear, Mike. The exhortation that, I've, that he's giving bears witness in my heart. And he, has, he would use a little different language than I would use, but what he was saying, in my opinion, is this, that there are pastors here whose hearts and attitudes have been the hearts and attitudes of hirelings. And that along the way you've become callous and insensitive to the reality that you've been called to minister in the name of Jesus. That some of you may have, by one means or another, sinned against the flock of God by not being sensitive and caring and committed. That some of you, much like the shepherds uh, that referenced in Ezekiel 34, have forgotten to heal the sick and seek the lost and bind the brokenhearted, have left off ministering to those that have had need, and have used the flock of God for personal gain. And God is calling men to account these days that have done just that. Just a few months ago, actually seven years ago, God spoke those very words to me. And I went through a severe repentance. And then again, a few months ago, the Lord said that I had allowed a residue of that to build into my heart. This time, he called me to repentance, not only for myself, but for others. And for about four months, I went into a deep repentance before God. Because I, I know that there's, there's truth in what God is saying to us right now. That many of us, along the way, have forgotten to be what we're supposed to be. We're to be the lovers of men's souls. We're to come to the, to the flock of God. Pastors, we're to come to the flock of God as, as a bridegroom to the bride and committed to her and to loving her and to caring for her. But some of us have been gigolos. We have not had any real commitment. We will we'll go to a church and we'll take that church, and we have no real commitment. It's a stepping stone. It's a place to be for a while until the big thing comes along. And, and we're very much like professional gigolos, making promises that we don't mean, that we don't even intend to keep. And God, our God, has been speaking to, to men all over the country in just this way. This isn't the first time this word has come forth. 
But it's, it's real every time. And I want to say, pastors, if you're here today and you have any reason to receive that message in your heart, I want to give you a chance right now to make public repentance. You just get out of your seats and come up here now and we'll pray with you. If you have any reason to believe that this is to you,
being healed. It's Christ. Lord, we're sorry that we have not loved. We're sorry that we've hindered your work. We're sorry that we've sought position and place. We're sorry that we have not sought you. Forgive us, oh God.
the people of the land belong to me, and you belong to me. All that you have is mine. Look and see the needs. See my people everywhere. See how they hunger. See how they thirst. See my people everywhere. But your hands shall I use. Your voice shall I use. Healing shall I bring to the land. And it's you who I have called. On this day, remember the words that you have heard. On this day, when you go forth, remember, you go forth in my name. You represent me. I shall bless my power at your disposal. You shall speak and the mountain shall move. The mountain shall move. The mountain shall move. Take someone's hand. My desire to be like Jesus. My desire to be like Him.
Father, this is our desire. Now that we know that we haven't, we are so grateful, O oh God, that you've shown us and that you've heard our prayer and you've known our repentance. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of repentance that you've given us. And we bless you, Lord, that you are the restorer of the church. We consecrate ourselves this day, O oh God, to your purposes that we may walk with you and do your bidding. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless you. Well, are you just about worn out? Well, you've worn us out, I'll tell you that. It's been a great week. Let me ask a question. I, I, I'm doing this for my own benefit, but I think I'd like to, to register in your mind. Many of you came here this week, if not skeptical, at least uh, with a very conservative viewpoint as to the things you were going to hear and see. Many of you came without any anticipation whatsoever of being victimized by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I'd like to ask you, how many of you with a show of hands could, could tell me that this week you're either healed or touched by the Holy Spirit or in some specific way ministered to supernaturally by the Spirit of God? Would you raise your hands? Now look around you, folks. Look around you. It's almost every person in every row. What are we learning this week? We're learning that our God is interested in us and our needs. It's overwhelming sometimes. The realization that He's so available and so immediate and so merciful, so generous to meet our needs. And we've had so little understanding of how to access ourselves to Him. Furthermore, to bless others in the same process. But we're learning, aren't we? Aren't we? Let's see what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church today. If you have your notes, we'll begin with page one. Here's a series of propositions. Some reflections on the part of myself and my wife as we prayed about what we're seeing in the church today. It may or may not be accurate, but it's what we think God is saying to us and what we see as we travel around the country and around the world. Propositionally, we start with this, that the church, the whole church, is one body the body of Jesus Christ in the world today. Now this is reflected in Scripture in 1 Corinthians 12, 20 and 27. It says, as, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. And then again, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And then again in Romans 12, 5, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all others. And so it's not news theologically that the body is one. But it, I'm not speaking from a theological perspective when I reference the oneness of the body. My friend David Watson said something a few years ago that sent tremors and shocks all over the United Kingdom. At a major conference there, he, he said, and I, I can't quote the exact language, but he said, I, I want to say this with some advisement, for your consideration, but he said on the one hand the Reformation was probably the greatest single event from the time of the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ until today. On the other hand, it may have been the most negative event in the church history. As a result of that one schismatic movement, there are now today over 20,000 denominations worldwide. End of quote. My perception is that in our quest for doctrinal purity, 
We have come to a place where we are straining out gnats and swallowing camels. In our desire to have the perfect perception of doctrine, we've come to a place where we no longer treat our brothers as the brothers they are. And I believe it wounds the heart of our God. I believe that the broken heart of the Father today is directly proportionate to the schism, the polarization, the distancing of brethren worldwide. I believe that if there's any one thing that God wants to do in this day, it's to draw the body of Christ together in oneness. And I don't know all of the ways that that can be done, and I'm not sure of all of the steps that ought to be taken, and I really have no revelation along those lines. But I would say this, that we have to start with the fact that we are one. You see, we're one because Jesus made us one. Regardless of what our faith and practice is, regardless of the differences in our doctrinal uh, positions, regardless of those things that, that we think would separa separate us and cause us to disqualify one another, we have become one at the cross of Jesus Christ. And a few years ago, as the Lord spoke to me in a time of great turmoil and tumult, I was at a place in my life where uh, my denominational group was uh, through with me. They were at, at tension. It wasn't so much over the charismatic influence. It was some other things. But I, I'm sure that that was part of it. And there was tension and there was dialogue going on. And, and uh, the Lord had told me not to retort, not to respond, not in any way to defend myself. At one crucial point, he spoke to me and he said, Your brother is never your enemy. Love your brother. Do not receive negative reports. Just love them. That was some of the best counsel I've ever gotten from God. You know, to this day, I don't know what was said about me. And I thank God for that. Because I don't have to work through forgiving people over things that I don't know what they said. And during that period of time, God kept speaking to me again and again and again and again about the oneness of the body of Christ. And I thought I had profoundly learned that lesson. I was thoroughly committed from that time forward to ministering to the whole body of Christ. When people would, uh, would uh, extend invitation, we'd pray, and if the Spirit of God said yes, we went. And it didn't matter to me whether they're Catholic or Protestant or how they practiced, or whether they worshipped on Saturday or Sunday, or, or what their means of baptism was, or how they expressed themselves in, through communion, or what they did. As long as Christ was central, as, as he was being lifted up in their church, I really didn't care. And that became a, a normative part of my existence, and, I, and I, I stressed that, and I talked about it, and I worked on it. And then I went through a very negative experience with a, with a group of brethren. And suddenly there, there became a bitterness in my heart. And I, didn't, and I, I recognized it immediately and dealt with it. I dealt with it as, with as, as sincerely as I knew how to deal with it. I, I, I went before the Lord. I repented. I said, oh God, I don't want to receive anything. I don't want to harbor anything. I don't want to. I, you see, one of the greatest fears in my life is that the Spirit of God will lift off of me. It's one of the greatest fears of my life, you see, because I am dull without Jesus. <laughs> I've got nothing to say. There was a time in my life that when I was scrutinized all of your sermons, I had some things to say. But since I've abandoned doing that, if God isn't here, I'm in trouble. And so I can't go any. I'm, I'm afraid to go any place without God. And I know that one of the things that offends and quenches the Spirit of God is when I harbor anything against anyone. And so I've tried to maintain a pure heart towards Him and towards all men. 
And yet, even then, a residue of nonsense and foolishness filtered into my heart. And a few months ago, God had to bring me to task, take me to task, and bring the issues up and deal with me. And I thank God that he's keeping me on a short leash these days and not allowing these things to, to stay for long periods of time and to, to develop a root system and be able to really get a hold. And my encouragement to you is that you begin just with this one basic reality. We are one. We are one in Him. We are inescapably connected to one another. In Colossians 3.12-15, uh, it expresses what our attitude should be towards the rest of the body of Christ. The text says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. About a year ago, I was meeting with a group of pastors. And uh, they, they were asking me about the growth of our church and because of my church growth background and some basic misconceptions they had uh, in, in the way I, I would be and the way I thought, they, they had really anticipated me coming and giving them a lot of techniques and, and methodologies on how to get their churches to grow. And uh, I can forgive people that because I, I know that feeling, I know that desire to, to get a, you know, a growing church and a big church. And, and uh, some of it, it's all mixed. You know, the motivations are mixed. You got some godliness in there and some carnality in there and, and you really sometimes can't hardly tell the difference yourself and so I, I'm really forgiving towards that kind of a thing but in this particular meeting it was getting pretty harsh and and they, they were really insistent you know like what do you do how do you get this to happen and at one point one pastor raised his hand and he said that I have to get my church to grow and he had been particularly objectionable in his behavior. And I saw the man as a man that was desperate inside, a wounded man, and, and I had a kindly attitude toward him, but I also realized that he had a real pugnacious uh, way about him, and uh, he probably bruises a lot of people. And I said, well, how big, do your church, do, what, how big a church do you want? He says, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, how big a church do you want? I mean, you're, you're asking me about a big church. How big a church do you want? He says, I don't know what you mean. And I said, well, what I mean is, how many more like you do you want? And he looked at me, and the Spirit of God came on him, and his face just began, you know, you've seen it now, the shaking. <laughs> and he began weeping, and he said, he said, I don't want any more like me. And he started sobbing, and he says, I want him to be like him. And I want to tell you something, that busted that meeting wide open. The realization that we don't need any more disciples like us. We need some like Jesus. And this is what the scripture is reflecting. That the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Since we are members of one body and we are called to peace. People... If you don't have a foundation of peace within yourself, then anything you build will be built on something else. And there has to come a point in time in your life, whether you're a pastor or not. As long as you're in the body of Christ, you have a ministry. And there has to come a point in time in which you have peace with God. And having found peace with God, out of the context of that foundation and that peace, everything must flow. You see, I think of, in my in my mind's eye, I think of peace like a like a little throw rug. 
And I have to stand on it all the time. And anytime I reach for things, I'm liable to get off that rug and I, and I lose my peace. I step away from it. And anytime I find myself away from that peace, I, 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 I recognize it through the behavior. And I have to hurry back and get at peace. Now the reason that's so essential is that if I want people to be like him, then I must be like him. If I want the church to be at peace, then I must start with me being at peace. And out of that context, everything flows. The peace of God must prevail in our hearts and lives. We must be one with one another, and the peace of God must prevail in our lives. If we are one, and we are at peace, then everything that happens stems from that. Let me tell you a secret. When this fellowship was six people, the peace of God was there. When it was 60 people, the peace of God was there. When it was 600, the peace of God was there. It's now approaching 6,000, and the peace of God is here. You know something? I don't care how many we have. If the peace of God wasn't there, I ain't going. I'm on my way. I'm back to find that throw rug. I'm here as long as there's peace. Peace in Him. That the peace of God would prevail and rule. That His presence would prevail and rule in all situations. Juan Carlos Ortiz said an interesting thing one time. He said, you know, he said, when we got to 200 people, we didn't love one another. Then we got to 400 people, and we still didn't love one another. When we got to 800 people that didn't love one another, we figured out something was wrong. <laughs> How many more do you want like you? I don't want any more like me. I want them to be like him. And I want to be like him. What is the attitude of most of the church? In Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 8 through 10, it says, Now Cain said to the brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? And he says, I don't know. He replied, Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord says, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. One occasion when things really got hard around here. It was earlier this year. My wife, who usually sets over on the left here in the, when, in the church services, you know how people find their place in the church, and she usually sets here, and as she was sitting here, the Lord, Spirit of God spoke to her and said, I'm going to empty the mother's wombs. Over the next two weeks, I believe six of our young women, including my daughter-in-law, lost new babies. My wife thought it was going to be an attack from the enemy, and she spoke to me on the way home that night. She said, oh, John, oh, John, the enemy is going to attack. We must pray, we must pray. Now, I'm used to her sounding the alarm because God has given her a responsibility, a ministry of intercessory prayer, and as such, she's always walking the ramparts, always looking out at the horizons. That's part of her responsibility and role in my life and in the fellowship's life. And so often, she's the first one to sound the bugle and ring the gong when something's going to happen. And so we begin praying and calling out to God, and speaking to God, and things got worse. One of our young wives, just a few months married, was followed home and raped. Tragically, tragically violated. One of our little girls, blind and uh, retarded, was taken out of a home where she was put in, and molested and actually left for dead. 
beaten, raped, harmed. And it kept coming and it kept coming and it kept coming. And we cried out to God with all that was in us. We said, God, stop the enemy. Stop the enemy. Stop the enemy. And one day he spoke to us and he said, I've allowed the enemy to do this. I have removed the hedge. For your sin is a stench to my nostrils. And we said, God, how have we sinned against you? We've not committed adultery. We're not into fornication. We're not lying. He says, your brother's blood cries to me from the earth. And suddenly we saw it. We saw it for the first time. We couldn't love the brethren in word only. It had to be a total consecrated commitment to loving all men and all women. We must protect the reputations of our brethren. And we began a repentance like we've never known. And we called out to God night and day. And we made, we reconciled, we made overtures, we went to people. I called people that I hadn't seen in 10 years as God brought them to heart and mind. And I would get on the phone with them, I'd go see them. I drove miles, I waited hours to meet with people that didn't want to see me. And I repented to them and I said, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. And I called the church to repentance and we turned from our wickedness. And we gave up our secret sins. And we turned away from those things that were controlling us and that, we had, that had violated that purity and piety of our hearts. As we've allowed ourselves to, to fall into this and to slip into that and to give room to this. And the enemy had built little fortresses and little places among us. And we, re we returned to God with all that was in us. And weeks went by. And I'm telling you, it was like a fire in my bones. Every time I came to church, I, I preached at them like I hated them and I loved them. But I hated what the enemy had been doing to us. And the people turned. And the people repented. Oh, it's not. Not everyone's repented. Not everyone has responded, but most have. And, this, and the season ended and God said, this has been good in my eyes. The Spirit of God is speaking to us tonight. And I tell you that the blood of our brothers calls from the ground. We have spilled their blood so glibly. Talked evil of them. Been uncaring, inconsiderate. We've defiled the very essence of a God's love for us by speaking ill of our brothers. And it's time to turn away from our sin. And we've ridiculed and we've, 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 uh, we've talked down. So, well, that, that, that guy, he's not really right on. You see, he's got this problem. And this guy over here, he's here. And, and that doctrinal, well, you know, that, that's the wrong position doctrinally there. And uh, don't go to that meeting. And we've treated the sheep like children. No wonder they never grew up. They never gave them a place to make decisions, to come to their own perspectives. And God says, that's enough. And I agree with God, don't you? It's time to move on. Well, what is the condition of the church today? The church as a whole. First of all, we have a problem with the prophets. Ezekiel of old said they are blind. He came forth in the land crying this message. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit. And have seen nothing. One day my wife was home most of the day. And she had on the uh, Christian television. And she heard person after person coming forth 
on the television. Thus saith the Lord, glibly, you know, the Lord says this, and the Lord says that, and the Lord does this, and the Lord is impressing me, and the Lord is directing me. And she listened to it, and as she listened to it, it just struck her spirit, and she finally ran into the bedroom and called out to God and said, Oh God, your prophets are blind. They prophesy of their own souls. They have not heard from you. They're not speaking from you. They dip out of one another's cups and call that the leading of God. And God spoke to us both that day profoundly and reminded us once again that we must go to the well. We must go to God. We must hear from God in this day. And we must turn away from this foolish preoccupation of venerating and lifting up one another and idolizing and worshiping them. Furthermore, the prophets have allowed the people to be looted. In Isaiah 42, 22, it says this, but this is, the, this is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. They have become plunder with no one to rescue them, and they have been made loot with no one to say, send them back. As you travel the land and you, and you meet in conferences, people by the thousands come and they're wounded and bleating and hurting and twisted. And they have no home and they have no shepherd and they have no meaningful relationship. And they vacillate from place to place and like pigs feed at any trough. They have no identity and they have no place in, in the body of Christ. And yet they're the children of God. But their shepherds haven't cared for them. They have not been embraced. They've not been cared for. They're not groomed. They're not looked after. And like a, an abandoned wife and children, they're left nameless and without identity. And they're easy prey for every guy that comes along with a new bit of doctrine, some sensational new teaching, something else to say to tickle their fancy and intrigue their minds. Furthermore, the prophets rule by their own authority. Jeremiah 5, 30, 31 says, A horrible and shocking thing has happened to the land. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority. And my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? And there's harshness and there's human effort going on in the church and people are calling the name of God and placing it over that. And it's not God. It is not God that is moving. It's the God of this world moving in the hearts of men and it should not be going on in the church of Jesus Christ. Our God has called us to worship Him and Him alone. And we must come to grips with the fact that we have been a people that acted as though we have not had a God. And we've made our own out of our own hands. And we say, how could we do that? Well, we did it the same way the children of Israel did. We just threw the gold in the fire and out it came. And you and I have done the same thing. Prophesying lies and ruling the people with their own authority. Let me tell you something about spiritual authority, people. When God's hand is on you, the authority does not have to be exercised. It just comes through you. People yield that to you all the time. But when it isn't, you have to fight for it to the nail. If you find yourself fighting for place and for leadership in your group, you better repent. Because God has lifted his hand off of you. Turn to him. Furthermore, they heal the people slightly or not at all. Jeremiah in the 8th chapter, 
verse 11, then, then again in 18 through 22, says this, They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. And they say, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Oh, my comforter and sorrow, my heart is faint within me. Listen to the cry of my people from the land far away. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king no longer there? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images and with their worthless foreign idols? The harvest is past and the summer has ended and we are not saved. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed and I mourn and horror grips me. Isn't there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Today, when the Spirit of God spoke to us as pastors, it was one of the most precious moments I've ever known as a Christian. The realization, once again, that the Good Shepherd is still shepherding shepherds. That he's still calling us to account. Haven't you had the fear, men? Haven't you had the fear that you might get away with something in this life? That's been one of my biggest fears. Again and again, I prayed to God, oh God, don't let me get away with anything. Nail me, Lord. Expose me. Deal with me publicly. But don't let me enter heaven having blown it. And once again today, he spoke. He spoke to us all, people. That's why I didn't have anything to say. He spoke to me again. Isn't it good to be where God's speaking? Isn't it good to be on a short leash with God? Isn't it good to hear from him? To have your heart stirred and your soul searched? By the creator of all things. The Lord of lords. The God of the universe. And of all creation. It's good to know him, isn't it? And it's good to be searched by him. And it's time that we quit healing the people slightly. With platitudes. And patent statements. And superficial counseling. Because our theology will not allow us to deal with the real depth of the problem. It's time for us to come to grips with the fact that we have become a people who have a form of godliness and have denied the power thereof. We must in this day enter into power. The plan of the enemy has become so sophisticated that he is able to devastate people at a level and in a, and in a way and in a magnitude like he's never done before in all the history of mankind. And I'm not talking about the hydrogen bomb. I'm talking about the social institutions that prevail in our culture. By the time a child gets through one of our schools, by the time a child gets up through puberty, they have been bombarded, assaulted at every level. They've been taught that fornication and adultery will, will increase their popularity. They've been bombarded at the point of enticement to drugs and every other kind of vile involvement. And it doesn't matter where you live in America. The circumstances are the same. And if we're to protect our children, we must come to grips with walking in purity and holiness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must heal the people in totality. And before we can heal them, we must be healed ourselves. Our God would call us to be first partakers of the fruit. And so we must seek the Lord while he may be found and receive the blessing of God and know his healing hand and know his touch and know the reconciliation of the Lord and become the people of God. And as we do it one on one on one on one on one, there will be a unity and there will be a force of God's power that will prevail over the totality of the earth. 
Our God is calling us to himself these days. Furthermore, they prophesy falsely. In Jeremiah 14, 14, it says, Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name, and I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own mind. Today we have people who have, uh, have moved into the vocation of the pastorate that have never been called of God. Because they were, had some prowess with the academic system, they were able to go through the academic system and the academic system to go through them, and in the process never had an encounter with the living God. And I tell you, it's time for the prophets to come to a place, to that mountain of God, and like Moses of old, to climb it and come face to face with Almighty God. If we're to have impact in this land today, we must have an encounter with God. And we must be able to say with all sincerity from our innermost being that our God reigns. And the only way we can say that is if he is reigning in our lives. What can we do about it? We can grieve and mourn and repent for the church because we are her priests. In Revelation 5.10 it says, You have made them to be kingdoms and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And then again in 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen people, a royal peace, priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. And then further in Ezra, the ninth chapter, verses 3-7, through seven, When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard and sat down in a ball. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of the unfaithfulness of the exiles, and I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Then at the evening sacrifice I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloth torn, cloak torn, and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed, O oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, my God, because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. And from the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great because of our sins. We and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and to humiliation at the hand of foreign kings, as it is today. And then further in Ezra 10, 1, it says, And when Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, gathered around him, and they too wept bitterly. You see, it has to start with one man. Ezra responded. Ezra responded as a priest. Ezra responded and he interceded and he turned and he repented and he turned away from. But he not only repented for himself, he repented for the nation. We believe that our God is one. We believe that the body of Christ is one. We have a theology for it, but we do not have the reality of it. Many in the body of Christ today rejoice when they hear of other brethren in difficulty. Oh my, did he? Mm. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. But you're not sorry at all. If you were sorry, you would rip your clothes and throw yourself to the ground and cry out for your brother who's been devastated by the enemy, who's been tricked and enticed into sin, but instead you rejoice in your heart because you always thought he was a little proud and vain and fleshly.
But it's time, my people, it's time for you and I to forsake the judging of one another. Hasn't Jesus himself spoken to us about this issue of judgment? Hasn't it been placed in his hand? All judgment on heaven and earth has been given to him. And he that is king and will ever reign as king will come soon as king and judge. But you and I have not been called to that responsibility. We've been called to brotherhood. To embrace and to care and to love. And as priests of God, we are to go before the throne of God and prevail for one another. The Spirit of God has stirred me numerous times as I've lived here in this county over the years. And in recent years, He has spoken to me several occasions. He said, John, I will not be happy until every church in this county is full. Until every Christian in this county is walking in the light and empowered to do your work. And so do not be satisfied with the work that's being done in your fellowship. Be praying continually for the whole community. This is God's heart. This is God's appetite. This is God's desire. That the whole body of Christ would be activated, empowered, filled. And you and I have the capability of helping that happen. Like Ezra, we can go to the wall for these, our brethren and call out to God and give him no peace and no rest. Like Bartimaeus, we can break through the crowd with our voices raised. Like the Syrophoenician mother, we can press until we get the boon and the blessing that we need for others. But as long as we see ourselves as separate from those other brethren, as long as we feel the freedom to judge their actions and judge their doctrine and judge their practices, as long as we can operate independently of them, then we have mistakenly come to that place. Because the Word of God does not allow for you and I to be separate from anyone that's been to the cross of Jesus Christ. And so we must become intercessors and priests, calling out to our God that these issues and things will be reconciled. In 2 Chronicles, the 7th chapter, verses 13 through 16, it says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Now for years I had... Uh, been aware of and had memorized this passage in 2nd Chronicles but I had never memorized the last two verses 15 and 16 and one day when I was speaking of this last I think it was March or February I was in Denver Colorado and speaking there and we had a conference and we had uh, several hundred pastors and, and leaders from all over several states there uh, even as we have here tonight and uh, the Spirit of God prevailed that night in fact I came to the meeting that night with the intention of teaching out of a syllabus that I was working out of. And when I arrived, Tommy Stipe took me aside and said, uh, John, I believe God wants you to give a prophetic word tonight. I said, well, I, why didn't he tell me? You know? <laughs> I mean, that was my immediate reaction. Like, I, I was sort of like bothered that he would even tell me that. And I said, well, you know, I'll pray about it. And a few minutes later, uh, Danny Daniels comes up to me and says, John, I believe that God has spoken and he wants you to give a prophetic word tonight. Well, by now, you know, in the mouth of two witnesses, I'm getting panicked, you know. And I, and I remember, I, I'm sitting back in the back room, and the worship is starting, you know, much like tonight, and they worship for a while, and, and, I, and I can't think, I mean, I, prophetic word, I can't think of anything, you know. I'm sitting there thinking, I wish I was home. <laughs> to play with my grandson, you know. And so, I'm sitting there in Tommy's office, and the Lord's not giving me anything. 
thing. And a, and a guy comes in and wants to chit-chat for a while. And, and here I am dying, you know, I'm about to go out in front of hundreds and hundreds of people with nothing to say. Except a prophetic word, which I don't have, you know. <laughs> you know the feeling? All right, so I'm sitting there, and uh, that guy goes, and another guy comes along, and the Lord tells me to minister to him, and the, the clock's ticking away, and I'm saying, Lord, how about me, you know. Just about a minute before they, they were going to have me come in, I closed with one, the, the exchange with this one person and turned around and the Spirit of God gave me five texts. Bang, 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 bang. Just like that. And I scribbled them down as fast as I could and, all, and, and I couldn't, I didn't even have a chance to look up the text. They, they just came to mind and, and, I, and I, I wrote the address down and, and I wrote a one sentence phrase about each one of them. You know, as quickly as I could. And hurried in and they were announcing me and, I, and they had a pulpit, something like this. And as I walked up to it, all of a sudden, a woman began singing in tongues. I thought, that's not the Lord. That was my first reaction. I judged it. And I, I, I thought, wait a minute. You don't do that. Wait. So I waited. And she finished singing in tongues. And then all of a sudden, she started interpreting, singing the same melody. And she'd gotten several words into it until I realized as I looked down, she was singing the very words I had written on my paper. And she sang it word for word. By the time she got to the fifth point, I was devastated. <laughs> devastated. You know what devastated means? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't talk. And I stood there, and the Spirit of God was on me, and He was dealing with my innermost being, you know. And He was telling me, you see, one of the fears I have, I don't know if you have this problem, but I have an ego state that, that I'm always afraid of being presumptuous. I, I have a fear of overstating it and going too much, you know, going too far. And, and, and I always wonder, you know, like, is God really taking me all that seriously? Do you have that feeling? And, and so here, you know, here I am, I'm standing here, and all of a sudden I realize the God of heaven is about to give a word to people. And he's chosen me. And because he knows what I'm like, he's giving me this encouragement, this fleece, to support what I'm about to do. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that something? That God would do that for you? Isn't that tender and intimate? I love him for that. And so I, I shared what I had to say. And as I shared it, it was a call to repentance. And, and the, the power of God prevailed in the room. And, and there was a, 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 a heavy sense of conviction that came over everyone, including me. And, and I, I finished. Uh, and right then, uh, a man, I believe spoken tongues and when he spoke in tongues the Lord gave me these words and I don't mean that I opened it up to, to the scripture I mean as he spoke in tongues the Lord says when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people now who's sending these de calamities when I shut up the heavens and there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now listen to this. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Get it? If we turn in calamity, where's the calamity coming from? It's coming from God. Why is he sending calamity? Because we haven't been turning. And we, he gets our attention through calamity. And it causes us to turn and if we turn and if we prevail in prayer and if we open ourselves to him, his ears and his eyes will be open to us. 
I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. This is our God speaking. My eyes and my heart will always be there. He has allowed things to come upon us that he may draw us to himself. He has rent us, but he will heal us. He has allowed the calamities to come as, a, as judgment upon our sin. But he will bring us through. And he will hear our prayers and see our situation and respond to us. We can all call out for the perfecting of the church. I believe that the highest call today on my life and on the lives of those that, that we are flowing with is to call for the complete, the completion, the perfecting of the church. In Ephesians 5.27, and it talks about the intent of Jesus, is, which is to present her, the church, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And then in Isaiah 62, 1 through 7, it says, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. And you will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem at the hand of your God. And no longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate. But you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord will delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. I have posted watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, that will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest, and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Our God has called us to this task. That the whole church, the total church, would become a praise on the earth. That the bride it would be prepared and that the work of the Lord Jesus Christ would go unfettered through sin and foolishness. But the bride would operate in piety, in purity, in the loveliness that she was called to have and provided for by God. And so we've been called to give the Lord no rest and give ourselves no rest until this occurs. Even today, the Spirit of God has spoken to me. Actually, it was uh, through a series of circumstances. As I was leaving the meeting today, uh, a man uh, caught me in the hall and, and uh, he started speaking to me and I was sort of in a hurry. I had a, a luncheon appointment. And, uh, and I, as I was walking along, I realized this is a divine appointment. The Lord's telling me to minister to this man. And so I stopped and we prayed. And I, I don't know fully what happened to him. He had a uh, problem with his hip and his knee and his uh, ankle. But this power of God came on him mightily. And it was fun. I, I always loved that. His leg was shaking. It was just great. I was watching it happen. And then he, uh, he uh, turned to my wife who was standing there and asked her to pray for him. Uh, he said, you know what, <laughs> it was cute. Uh, the Lord was doing this wa wonderful thing on his leg, you know, just shaking it violently as he was healing it. And the man had a sinus condition. He said, you suppose the Lord will heal my sinuses also. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, might as, you know, you might as well get it while you can. And, uh, <laughs> and so Carol started to pray for him and the power of God came over his face. And it was beautiful what was happening there. And then afterwards, he pulled her face down and said, today... The Lord is going to answer the prayer of your heart. And my wife knew it was a word from God that moment. And as we went out and got in the car, she turned to me and, and uh, we began talking about it. And we, and we have two or three prayers of our heart. You know, one concerning a son that we want to see fully you know, brought into the kingdom. Uh, but the primary prayer of our heart, of course, is for the church. 
the church at large, the church in total. But another aspect is that we've been praying that God would deepen us in prayer. You see, I've just preached a, a sermon, a mandate that I can't perform unless I deepen in prayer. Unless I become a man of prayer, I can't do what I just encourage you to do. And I might as well have preached this to myself tonight. And as I sat there at noon, Larry Lee was sitting next to us, and I had known that the church on the rock that, uh, that Larry was sharing with, the, the, the church that he's uh, pastoring, was started in a prayer meeting. But I wasn't aware that that prayer meeting has continued for three and a half years, meeting every morning, and that the people have learned to prevail in prayer and to call out to God. And as I sat there and I listened to Larry, the Spirit of God just came over me and said, this is it. I am sending this man to you to teach you to pray. I thought, all right. <laughs> I mean, when the Lord treats, it's okay to say, all right. And the Lord was treating me good right then. <laughs> because I have asked the Lord many times in this last year to deepen us in prayer. And I have made several false starts. On one occasion, we organized prayer groups. On other times, I fasted and prayed for several days. And I've done several. I, I, it isn't that I don't pray. I pray all the time. But I know there's so much more that I'm not experiencing. And I want to grow in it. And God stirred me today and said, I've sent this man to teach you to pray. And I said, thank you, Jesus. And the moment he said that, I knew that that's what the other man had prophesied concerning. People, we must take this seriously. We must leave off criticizing the body of Christ. Right? Right? We must turn away from our preoccupations with success that has caused us to go halfway, to take halfway measures. And we must persevere and climb the mountain and go to the fount and get our, our source in God. Right? We must turn away from those, those patterns of the prophets of old. Pastors, we must turn away from those things. We must seek the Lord and love the people and bless them and care for them and lay our lives down as the Good Shepherd would have us do so. And we must come as the household of God and as the priests of God, seeing ourselves connected to every man, woman, and child that is on the earth today that's under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of those doctrinal differences, regardless of those things that we think are just utterly foolish in their lives. If they claim Jesus, we must claim them. They are our brethren. And we must come as the priests of God, calling out to God that His Word and His presence and His works would prevail in the hearts of the, every member of the body of Christ and that the body of Christ would become what she's supposed to be in our day. I believe that if we will do that, I believe that if we will seek the Lord, that He will be found and that He will meet us in that circumstance. Amen.